we've discovered Kepler 22b, a small exoplanet in the Cygnus constellation. Seems like nothing important, right? But it's actually a big deal. This is the first planet located in the habitable zone that was found by the Kepler telescope. In other words, there may be water on this planet, and if there's water, there may be life. Kepler 22b can become our new potential home. So let's take a closer look at it. Actually, discovering new planets is not easy at all. Not all of them can be seen through our super cool telescopes, even the almighty Hubble. Sometimes the stars are so small and dim that it's really hard to find them on a map. The same thing happened with Kepler 22. In such cases, scientists have to use a special method. First, they take a bunch of photos of the star in different periods of time. Then, they look at them and think, hmm, are there any dark dots on this star somewhere? And if they find one, that might be a planet. These photos actually help us to discover some very important stuff. Like, first of all, this planet exists. Secondly, here is its size, radius, and proximity to the star. And finally, will we be able to live there? Now we know that Kepler 22b is very similar to our planet and could potentially become a second Earth. It's also very close to us, only 635 light years away. Yeah, it's about three quadrillion miles, but this is one of the closest options. Kepler 22, the star of Kepler 22b, is a yellow dwarf. It's very, very similar to our sun. The same size, the same radius, even the age is almost the same. 4 billion years. The difference is only in luminosity. It's about 20% dimmer than the sun. So, no matter how much you strain your eyes, you won't see this star in the night sky. The planet Kepler 22b is about 2.4 times larger than our Earth, and that's pretty good. More radius means more potential water and space to live. Although going from one city to another would take a while. It's scary to even imagine a three-day long plane flight. We don't know the exact mass of this planet, but scientists think it's bigger than Earth's. Actually, the mass of Kepler 22b can be up to 36 times greater than that of our planet. What does it mean? Vigorous gravity. If the planet is 36 times heavier than Earth, then gravity there will be about six times stronger. Can you barely lift 20 pounds of potatoes? Try 120. Not to mention that you yourself can become much heavier on that planet. You'll have to get incredibly pumped up just to walk there. You have to literally turn yourself into a bodybuilder just to get to work. The worst thing is that with such gravity, it'd be incredibly difficult for plants to survive there. They'd need at least a little freedom to rise up from the ground. And animals. Our dogs and cats would have to turn into little balls of muscle to survive there. But if this planet has its own animals or other inhabitants, we can roughly imagine what they may look like. They probably have a lot of legs to make moving easier. They aren't really tall, but they're very massive and extremely strong. Hmm, muscular giant spiders? Could be worse, I guess. The good news is that this is all unconfirmed information. If we're very lucky and gravity there turns out to be just a bit stronger than Earth's, then of course, it'll be much easier to live there. The next thing we know about Kepler 22b is that it's about 15% closer to its star than we are to the sun. If Kepler 22b existed in our solar system, it would be located somewhere between Earth and Venus. Does that mean we're all going to burn? No, silly. As I mentioned before, the star Kepler 22 is pretty cold, just some 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's why we can assume that the temperatures on Kepler 22b will be about the same as we have on Earth. If the planet orbits its star the same way Earth orbits the Sun, which we don't actually know, Kepler 22b can rotate around its star on its side, like, for example, Uranus. What? Didn't you know Uranus is actually lying on its side? Also, look at its rings. Yes, Uranus also has rings, like Saturn, but they're vertical. The universe is truly a mysterious place. So, 
If Kepler-22b is really something like that, then the weather on the planet will be, to put it mildly, not very good. Incredibly cold winters will be regularly followed by hot summers. And, just like with tidally locked planets, we'd be able to live more or less comfortably only on the narrow piece of land between these two crazy sides. Let's hope that this is not the case and the planet rotates normally. But it's not all that bad. Studies show that there may be an ocean on Kepler-22b. You already know that water means life, but in this case, it's also a big plus because a planet covered by an ocean always has more stable temperatures. The water absorbs some of the heat and distributes it evenly across the planet. The hot parts cool down and the icy ones warm up. By the way, that's exactly what happened to Earth billions of years ago. When our planet started getting its first little puddles, our beloved moon helped these puddles to spread all over the planet. Thanks to this, a burning horror that used to be our Earth turned into a cute little ball full of life. So if Kepler-22b has water but no atmosphere, scientists think that the average temperature there could be around 12 degrees Fahrenheit. But if there's also an Earth-like atmosphere, then the temperature can reach 72 degrees Fahrenheit. That would be nice. And finally, one year there is equal to 290 Earth days, about nine months. The planet has no natural satellites, so unfortunately, we'd have to say goodbye to a beautiful view of the moon. On the bright side, we'd probably be able to see the sun as a distant little star. We could admire it in the night sky, remembering our home, while not hiding from giant spiders. And this is all that we know at the moment. Unfortunately, it's quite difficult to explore such planets, so there's a lot of very important data that we don't know. For example, what kind of planet is this anyway? Yep, we're missing the most important information about Kepler-22b. We don't know if it's a rocky planet or not. And if not, then all the previously mentioned information means nothing. It may turn out to be a gas planet, or a planet covered with gas but with a solid core, like Neptune, or a water world covered with a giant ocean. In this case, it better be a water planet. Then at least we could build some kind of underwater city there. We could filter the water and eat fish until we evolve into an amphibious species. Does it even count as evolution if we go back to our roots? Scientists, however, think that Kepler-22b may turn out to be a Neptune-like planet. Some astronomers have even assigned the planet to a category of mini-Neptunes. Yes, this is a real planetary category. But this hasn't been proven yet. But even if, fortunately for us, Kepler-22b turns out to be a rocky planet, we still don't know what the atmosphere is like there. Does it exist at all? What if it turns out to be something like the atmosphere of Venus? which is more toxic than your ex. Then we'd have to dig deep underground to somehow survive on this planet. And then we'd have to come up with a heat source because it's pretty cold underground. Yeah, let's hope this won't be the case. There are many possibilities with Kepler-22b. So far, we don't have a clear answer, but let's hope that scientists will find it before we load the first people into shuttles and send them to conquer Kepler-22b. That would be awkward if it turns out to be a gas planet, or something like that. It's the year 2600, and the new Frontiers program has finally begun. You've got the list of planets to plan dwellings for, and the first one is Venus. The Earth's evil twin sister meets you with a refreshing 800 degrees Fahrenheit and a beautiful sulfuric acid rainstorm. First of all, the heat means living on the surface here is next to impossible. So you immediately put the prospective house several dozen feet underground. The walls, floor, and ceiling must be made of some heat-resistant and durable material. So you make them out of hafnium carbide. Discovered way back in 2016, it withstands temperatures of over 7,000 degrees. Next, you install the air cooling and purification system. It captures the toxic air from the Venusian atmosphere and pulls it through a complex network of filters, delivering breathable air to the dwelling. As an added benefit, the temperature of this air can be easily turned up thanks to what's going on outside. You can create a separate room below the main space and dub it the generator room. 
The device there will use the almost infinite geothermal energy of the planet to provide the house with electricity. You think for a moment and add a geothermal bathroom as well. There's no water on Venus, but it can be extracted and separated from its acidic clouds. The piping system would include a heating unit for hot water and a cooling unit with liquid nitrogen for cold water. Another separate space is the garden. Since no plants can survive on the surface, you create a spacious hall with bright lights on the ceiling and a sprinkler system throughout the area. You have large patches of soil for vegetables, several acres for fruit plants, and a big patch in the center for a couple of long-living trees like oaks. They'll provide additional oxygen for the whole building. The garden is encased in a shell of hafnium carbide as well, so that the plants don't wilt in the excess heat of the Venusian soil. You check if everything's accounted for and go to your next stop. Saturn. It's a gas planet, but there's a thin yet stable layer that can be called the sweet spot. Its temperature is just right for humans to feel fine. You create a hover platform to build your house on. There's just no solid ground on Saturn at all. The platform's equipped with wind-powered turbines. The winds on the gas giant reach incredible speeds, so it will need to counteract them, at the same time feeding from the hurricanes. The pressure and temperature are just about right in this place, so your main concern is the wind again. You make the dwelling low and looking almost like a frisbee for better aerodynamics. The walls and roof are made from a single slab of sturdy metal so that powerful gusts can't tear the roof away. You also make them several feet thick and add some windows with space-grade glass panes that won't break. Water can be extracted from another layer using a series of similar platforms with built-in pipes. Electricity and heat are no problem either, thanks to the powerful winds. The only problem here is food, but it can be imported from other inhabited planets at first, along with the fertile soil for the garden. You create a space for it on another hover platform for the future. Satisfied with your results, you head to the next destination on your list, Europa. This moon of Jupiter's is covered in a miles-thick crust of ice full of canyons and crevices. But deep below, there's a whole ocean of salt water bigger than all the oceans on old Earth taken together. You take it into account and go for an underground dwelling again. The temperature is freezing, but the closer you are to the hot planetary core, the warmer it is. You place the dwelling as deep as you can to safely extract water from the underground ocean. The walls and ceiling are padded with insulation, and in the cellar, there's a home water purification system that turns salty water into the potable kind. Since there's no atmosphere to speak of, the breathable air is extracted from the ice. As it melts, the water vapor is collected and filtered, then enriched with other necessary substances and delivered to the dweller. As for food, you go for an unusual solution – edible marine plants and fish. You create a separate tank to cultivate algae right in the ocean, and different kinds of fish can be imported from Old Earth and other inhabited planets to breed on Europa. Next stop? Pluto. The tiny dwarf planet, just one-sixth of Old Earth in width, has a great potential for terraforming. So you immediately create a big dome for your dwelling. The sun shines much weaker here than in any other place in the solar system, so you make sunlight-enhancing panels all across the dome. They'll allow the surface underneath to receive more light and warmth, bringing the area to a comfortable temperature. The ice on Pluto consists of frozen water, just like on Earth. So you build a station for melting it and collecting the resulting liquid into large tanks for later use. There's also a possible liquid ocean deep under the surface. So you add a deep drilling platform, but put a question mark on it. You don't know if it's going to be useful yet. With the area warmed up and well lit, you make a pretty ordinary dwelling like ones we're used to on old Earth and terraform Mars. A couple of stories, carbon or titanium alloyed walls and ceiling for durability, and a fortified cellar. Still, you also add emergency insulation padding that will only trigger if something happens to the lighting dome. If it's breached, the temperature will quickly drop to below freezing. There's also very little atmosphere on Pluto, so breathable air will have to be generated from the ice again. This time, you combine the water collecting system with the air generating facility. 
While one produces potable water, the other will collect vapor and enhance it with all the necessary elements. You even go as far as to create a weather controlling device. It will heat up or cool down different layers of the produced air and mix them together to create winds and rain clouds just like on old Earth. This will allow crops to grow in a more natural environment, and Pluto might even become a green planet one day. Right above, in the dark blue sky, Pluto's biggest moon, Charon, is hanging. It's half the dwarf planet in size, which makes it a spectacular view. Its climate is almost identical to that of Pluto's. In a fit of inspiration, you create a vacation home for Plutonians. Here, under a similar dome, they'll be able to explore another little world and look at their dwarf planet from the other side. Which is always the same side, by the way, like the Earth's moon, which reminds you of the next destination. Zarmina, previously known as Gliese 581g. It's 41 light years away, the longest trip so far. The planet's tidally locked to its sun, which means there's perpetual day on its one side and eternal night on the other. It's not only about light, but heat as well. The day side is much hotter, and the night side is partially covered in ice. Unless we terraform the planet, the most comfortable area to inhabit is right between the two sides, called the Terminator Zone. It's neither too hot nor too cold here, and there's an eternal twilight. The sun is always just above the horizon. The good news is that the atmosphere on Zarmina, although volatile, is rather close to the old Earth's. But you still cover the selected area with a protective dome just in case. Human dwellings here don't have to be specially protected from the elements. And there's liquid water, too. You build a pretty generic house, much like the one on Pluto, but then add a few crucial details. First, the weather controlling device. Despite the old Earth-like atmosphere, dwellers will need a stable change of weather to grow crops. Then you cover the dome with moving plates. Living in a constant dust might be pretty depressing, so the plates will move in 12-hour patterns. During the daytime, they will turn to enhance the sunlight, while at night, they'll deflect it back, making the sky dark. After that, you travel to both edges of the Terminator Zone and install geothermal plants. On the hot side, the plant will generate energy for all the settler's needs and take hot water to use in households. On the cold side, the system will make cold water for the ice. The night side can also be used as a giant refrigerator. Dwellers could store things they need frozen here. To make it easier to access, you stretch the dome from edge to edge and create some simple storage facilities where the night begins in earnest. We've been focusing on trying to find life on Mars so much, while there is this gem waiting to be explored. This planet is the sixth farthest from the Sun and the second largest in the solar system. You'll find it right behind Jupiter. I'm talking about Saturn, or as they sometimes call it, the jewel of the solar system. It's so different from our planet. First of all, you wouldn't be able to stand there. While Earth consists of rock and other tough stuff, this planet is like a giant ball, mostly made of gases. If you found a swimming pool huge enough to fit Saturn, you could see the planet floating in the water. No wonder, Saturn is the least dense planet in the solar system. It also contains a lot of helium. You know, the gas you put in balloons to make them hover in the air. Saturn is a very windy planet. Winds there are more than four times stronger than the ones we have on Earth. A day over there lasts 10 hours and 14 minutes because Saturn spins on its axis pretty fast. But the planet takes its time while going around the Sun. A year there equals 29 Earth years. Saturn's radius is more than 36,000 miles. It means the gas giant is nine times wider than our planet. If Earth was the size of a nickel, Saturn would be as big as a volleyball. Even though some of our planets in our solar system also have rings, Saturn's are the most spectacular ones. You can even see its rings from Earth. And no, you don't have to be a scientist with insanely expensive equipment. All you need is a small telescope. Saturn's rings are not firm. They are made of pieces of dust, rock, and ice. Some of them are as small as grains of sand, and some as big as a house or even a mountain. These are actually bits of asteroids, comets, and shattered moons that fell apart before reaching Saturn. They could be torn into pieces by the planet's powerful gravitational pull. Saturn has over 50 moons, and recently, scientists have discovered some unusual hydrothermal activity on one of them. Enceladus is Saturn's sixth biggest moon. It has four tiger stripes close to one of its poles. Researchers have found that there is an ocean underneath these stripes. 
Water and ice erupt from that area. So now we can't but wonder, maybe there's life out there. In the oceans on Earth, some forms of life gather around similar hydrothermal vents. They feed on the chemicals there, same as plants on the surface do with sunlight. And not only that, some of the oldest microbial life on our planet feed on the same energy as the one produced beneath the ocean surface on Enceladus. It could potentially mean there's life developing there right now. Of course, it takes millions and millions of years for even the simplest organisms to appear. But hopefully, scientists will need less time to find more complex forms of life. There are millions of exoplanets out there in space, and scientists have been searching for those that could be potentially habitable. Exoplanets are planets orbiting a star outside of our solar system. Dwarf stars are similar, less luminous than the sun. They sometimes live for more than 10 billion years. That's enough time for a living organism to develop and evolve into a more complex form. Life might appear on the planets orbiting such dwarf stars, or, like with Saturn, on one of their moons. And here it is, Gliese 876b that orbits the red dwarf star Gliese 876. This planet is mostly a mystery, but scientists assume this is a gas giant that has no solid surface. They believe its atmosphere doesn't have clouds, but there might be water in its liquid form on the planet's surface. T Gardens B orbits a red dwarf that's around 12 light years away from our solar system. The planet's mass is just a bit higher than that of Earth. Scientists think it may have a rocky surface. The planet needs around five days to complete its orbit. It means that one year on T Gardens B is actually shorter than one week on Earth. Somewhere far, far away, there's another potentially habitable planet named Kepler 1638b. Okay, to be more precise, it's 3,000 light years away from Earth in the constellation Cygnus. This planet is four times as heavy as Earth and twice as wide. It needs almost 260 days to complete one orbit around its star. The gravity on this planet is stronger than that on Earth. It wouldn't be an easy feat to jump on its surface. One more Kepler coming along. This time, it's Kepler-62e, a planet that's more than one and a half times the size of Earth. Scientists believe this one has a warm, humid, and hospitable atmosphere with cloudy skies. There are 1,200 light years between Earth and this planet. Kepler-62e needs 122 days to orbit its red dwarf star. Its neighbor, Kepler-62f, is another potentially habitable zone. It's a world around 40% bigger than Earth, Scientists think this planet might be covered in water. The oceans on our planet are full of interesting creatures and organisms of all sizes. So the chances are this planet also hides some intriguing living beings, or at least it has the potential to develop life. When we say habitable, it doesn't mean life definitely exists there. It just means there are conditions for some forms of life to develop. LHS 1140b is a planet located in one of the potentially habitable zones. Unlike its gas companions, it's solid and quite rocky. The planet's radius is 60% larger than that of Earth, and its mass is seven times bigger. It's one of the densest planets found out there. Since the planet has a big mass, an atmosphere there must be rather thick. Plus, gravity on its surface is much stronger than here on Earth. That's why you would likely have problems just standing on that planet. Hello and greetings from TRAPPIST-1, an ultra-cool dwarf in the constellation Aquarius. It's around 39 light years away from us. Seven Earth-sized rocky planets are orbiting in the star's habitable zone. All of them can potentially have some water on their surfaces. The temperature on these planets is more or less similar to that on Earth. On the Moon, gravity is only 16% of what we have on our home planet. That's why the astronauts could hardly control their movements when they visited our natural satellite. But when it comes to the gravity on TRAPPIST-1 planets, you would probably feel good and comfortable there. And Kepler once again. This time it's Kepler-452b. It's a rocky planet 60% larger than Earth. Its parent star is similar to our Sun. This planet has actually spent around 6 billion years in the habitable zone, while Earth has been there for a mere 4.5 billion years. This planet needs 385 days to orbit Kepler-452. This star is around 20% brighter than our Sun, but has the same temperature. The whole system is very far from our little oasis. It would take you 28 million years to get there. And now, how about KOI 7711.01?
It's another intriguing world 1,700 light years away from us. This planet is only 30% bigger than Earth. It gets almost the same amount of heat as we receive from our sun. Sometime in the future, people might start colonizing the galaxy. They would be looking for new planets to live on. Then we'd certainly have to make really long trips. And maybe one day, we'd reach Proxima Centauri. It's a nearby star that has a couple of planets we could potentially inhabit, like Proxima Centauri b. It's around four light years away from Earth, and it doesn't sound that far at first, but it actually is. It would take about 6,300 years to travel there, if we use the technologies that are available these days. It would mean many, many generations to make a trip like that, and it would take even longer to finally inhabit that new world. People would be born and raised on spaceships. They would live their lives there without ever seeing either Earth or the planet they're heading to. Instead of trees, mountains, and rivers, there would be only the dark nothingness of faraway galaxies spreading in front of them. They would never be able to wander unknown streets, breathe in the fresh air, feel the wind. The only place for them to travel to would be another part of the ship. Certainly, such a journey wouldn't be simple, but it would pay off if people managed to build some more beautiful worlds like the one we have here on Earth. Is that even possible? Time will tell. You know, many different things have nothing in common at first glance. The appearance of mysterious clouds over Stonehenge and the migration of wolves in Canada. Patterns on the wings of a Caribbean butterfly and strange footprints on the moon's surface. These are all random facts, but people can see connections in these events. Let's see how it can happen and where it can lead to. Imagine reading some crazy article on one of the unreliable sites forgetting about it, and then beginning to notice small details in the world that might indicate that the information in this article is true. You realize you've learned something unusual. But for some reason, other people don't see it or don't want to see it. You try to tell them, but no one wants to listen to you. And some people even think you've gone mad. Let's stop for a moment and see what kind of article you've read. So, in 2017, one not-so-truthful site published a story about a ship from another planet called Black Knight that had been spying on people for 12,000 years. But not long ago, agents from a secret organization managed to destroy it. Sounds like absolute nonsense or a plot for a cheap sci-fi movie. Of course you don't believe it. But a few years later, you find a story about Nikola Tesla. Let's fast forward to 1899. The famous scientist was sitting in his laboratory in Colorado Springs, conducting radio experiments. Suddenly, his receiver caught a strange radio signal. Then, after a while, another one. The signals came in with the same time interval, as if someone wanted to send a message. Nikola Tesla realized it could be something from extraterrestrial civilizations that were trying to start a dialogue with people using the most universal language, math. He also reported about this event in a magazine at the beginning of the 20th century and added that he hadn't deciphered the message. Okay, now, let's forget about it and see what happened next. In 1927, an engineer from Oslo, who was fond of radio devices, was sending signals into open space. He was surprised when, sometime later, the same signals began to return to his receiver. It was as if the signals bounced off something big and echoed back, or something received these messages and then sent them back to the sender to make an acquaintance. The man quickly reported his discovery to scientific journals, and perhaps someone connected this event with Nikola Tesla's words about strange signals from space. All this were just prerequisites for the Black Knight. But the most exciting events started decades later. In the 60s, Time magazine published an article that said that the U.S. had discovered a satellite orbiting Earth and using unknown technology. A couple of years later, Project Mercury astronaut Gordon Cooper reported that he had seen a strange object during his spaceflight. But the Black Knight became really famous only in the late 90s when NASA published a series of images of a mysterious object. During the first flight to the ISS, astronauts noted weirdly shaped somethings and took several pictures. Then someone gathered all the facts, collected all the information about the black satellite, and discovered that it had been flying around our planet for more than 10,000 years. How did they figure it out? 
people managed to calculate the age of those radio signals that Tesla and the engineer had received. If this is true, the Black Knight appeared much earlier than the Sumerians in ancient Egypt. What if this satellite helped build pyramids and majestic temples? What if it had been watching over our development all this time and transmitting this information to another planet? What if mysterious images ancient people drew depicted the satellite? People began to suspect NASA and other space agencies of hiding information about the black object to prevent panic. And now, after having received all the data about the mysterious satellite, you might begin to suspect that the bizarre article may actually be true. This news is so improbable and ridiculous that no one will believe it. If you want to hide something, hide it in plain sight. And so, together with other enthusiasts, you start hunting for any information about the mysterious ship. You create forums, post photos of unknown objects, and become obsessed with this topic. You really believe in the reality of the Black Knight. Moreover, you don't want to question its existence. And people reading your articles do the same. Congratulations! You have become an ideal candidate for creating fake news in the yellow press. Such myths and urban legends seem attractive. The human brain feels pleasure when it finds fake secret information. The feeling of mystery, adrenaline, and shock can cause psychological addiction. That's why the stories about the Black Knight are still alive. Mysterious facts seem logical, and people stop seeing information that refutes their theories. The case of the Black Knight is no exception. The fans of this black object believe that Nikola Tesla received signals from some space civilization. But for some reason, they don't attach importance to scientific articles, which say that such radio signals could be sent by giant space objects like pulsars. A pulsar is a rotating neutron star emitting powerful electromagnetic radiation. Such radiation is often found in space. These radio waves don't imply the presence of a mind and a sender. The cosmos is full of such signals. The technology for detecting such objects were created in the 60s. Or maybe Tesla's device caught a signal coming from our planet. Besides, the scientists didn't see anything about the Black Knight. So why did people connect these two events? That story with the Norwegian engineer is still unexplained. Yes, his signals returned as an echo. But this had nothing to do with the flying object in question either. You might as well say that the satellite somehow influenced the Titanic. There's no logic in such assumptions. Strangely, no one connected the Black Knight with the Yeti or the Kraken. Now, let's return to that Times article about a strange object flying around Earth. It also stated it was a fragment of an American reconnaissance satellite. But fans of myths and legends apparently didn't notice this explanation. As for astronaut Cooper, who was said to spot some object during his mission, he actually saw nothing. He even showed a transcript with no reports about the black satellite. However, some believers in other civilizations keep silent about this fact. So, the main proof of the Black Knight's existence is the photos taken during the first flight to the ISS. The astronauts noticed this strange object and took pictures. But it wasn't a surprise for them, because some part of the ship broke away during some work they did outside. It was a piece of thermal coating. The astronauts sent the photo to NASA, and the space agency assigned it a personal number, as it does with all such objects. A few days later, the Black Knight fell out of orbit and burned up in Earth's atmosphere. Almost all this information was recorded in official protocols. One of NASA's engineers, who knew the photographer of the Black Satellite, explained that those famous photos depicted an ordinary piece of the ship. There was nothing fantastic about it. But the fans of extraterrestrial rockets must have missed all this information. All these myths have long been debunked and all the false facts have been refuted. But the Black Knight continues to live in many people's minds and on the pages of the yellow press. It has become a link between many reports of strange flying objects. Over the years, hundreds of stories have appeared about secret laboratories with extraterrestrial technologies, about NASA hiding secrets, and about creatures from other planets. And many people connected these myths with the Black Satellite. It has stopped being a real physical object. Now it's a cultural phenomenon. 
Remember how the main symbol of extraterrestrial civilizations was a flying saucer? It's not trending anymore. Today, the symbol is a black, weirdly shaped stone. Don't be fooled. When we think of active volcanoes, one region comes to mind – the Ring of Fire in the Pacific Ocean. Three quarters of Earth's volcanoes sit within this belt. Compare the area to Australia, which doesn't have any volcanic activity. The old continent of Europe is also calm. Or at least, we like to think so. Can you guess what the most active volcano in Europe is? If you thought of Mount Etna on the island of Sicily in Italy, you were right. The volcano has erupted about 200 times and has been far from sleeping in recent decades. The last time this happened was in August 2023. The highest mountain in the Mediterranean is half a billion years old. But in Iceland, there is a much younger volcano. It sprang into action on the 10th of July 2023. In the afternoon, three fissures appeared in the ground on a peninsula in the southwest of the island. This was at a base of a small mountain peak. Its name means Little Ram in the local language. The volcano spewed molten lava high into the air. There were also gas plumes in the area. But the scientific community wasn't surprised by the event. They already knew about the volcanic area that stretches between the cities of Reykjavik and Keflavik. Its name is hard to pronounce. Hey, I want to buy a vowel. It had already erupted during the previous two summers. This activity came after eight centuries of dormancy. In the days leading up to the latest eruption, seismologists, the scientists who study earthquakes, recorded over 12,000 tremors. When the ground opened up in July, the fissures were over a mile and a half long. The following morning, two of them closed. All the lava was now coming out of the last fissure. It grew into an elongated cone the simplest shape of volcano we are all familiar with. The lava soon filled a large crater. It grew almost 100 feet tall during the first week. And it is still growing. On the night when the eruption started, lava spread out in all directions. Its cinders set ablaze the dry moss in the vicinity. Local authorities closed off the surrounding area. There were toxic gases from the volcanoes and smoke from the burning moss. Firefighters flocked to the area. After a week, they proclaimed the area safe. Visitors soon came to witness the birth of Europe's youngest volcano. This form of tourism is quite developed in Iceland. People come from all over the world to watch active volcanoes. The land of fire and ice is home to more than 130 volcanoes. Some 30 of them are active. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. Is volcano tourism safe? In Iceland, it is. The country's authorities research and constantly monitor all of the hotspots. The island is dotted with several dozen seismic stations. These help researchers accurately predict future eruptions. And emergency services are accustomed to these sorts of events. They can quickly cordon off danger zones. This is what happened in 2010. A volcano in the south of the island, the name of which everyone struggled to pronounce, erupted. It spewed out a plume of steam and ash that was 7 miles high. Uh, this wasn't a fun time to be an air traveler. Winds carried the enormous plume southeast toward northern Europe. Many countries closed their airspace for several days for safety reasons. The volcano erupted in March, but the Earth was shaking from January the same year. So seismologists knew that an eruption was approaching. When it comes to the continent's youngest volcano, the tourist infrastructure is already there. Visitors can leave their cars at a designated parking lot. Then they go on a five-hour-long trek. This leads to a viewing deck. Tourists are so close to the epicenter that they can feel the heat haze from the crater. The site is the most impressive at nighttime. Safety is never a concern. Scientists regularly chart out hazard maps that outline the borders of lava fields. This way, visitors who stick by the rules are never in harm's way. More than a week after the eruption started, a section of the crater collapsed. Lava flowed downhill west of the volcano. This majestic smoldering hot river is slow-moving lava. Scientists categorize it as an a-a type. The term is Hawaiian. It describes basaltic lava that has a rough and brittle surface. 
The flow is composed of broken lava blocks that are called clinkers. They fall off as the substance flows. This reveals red-hot areas. The cooler sections of lava are gray and black in color. When it moves forward, it produces a distinctive sound like shattering glass. Nearly a month after the eruption of the new volcano, we got aerial footage of an interesting phenomenon. A tornado formed directly over the lava flow. This occurs due to the high temperatures in the area. When the conditions are right, a column of heated air can easily turn into a mini-tornado. Scientists observed a similar event happen during the 2018 eruption of Mount Kilauea in Hawaii. The lava fields of Europe's second-largest island tell the story of the creation of Iceland. It sits above the place where the North American and Eurasian plates meet each other. Tectonic plates are huge, rocky chunks of Earth's most outer layer. There are roughly 20 of them. They rest on a partially molten layer of rock. All the lava we see on the surface starts its journey here. You could say that these plates float on molten rock. Their boundaries are unstable. So when two plates grind past each other, they release tremendous amounts of energy. The formation of volcanoes is one result. These are places where the molten rock travels upward to the surface. Iceland began to form some 60 million years ago. The tectonic plates under the ocean drifted apart. Enough lava piled up on the surface to create solid ground. This ancient rock is under the waves today. As new lava reaches the surface and cools down, it pushes the old rock away from the center of the island. That's why the oldest parts of Iceland aren't 60, but only 16 million years old. The country's active lava fields are young in geological terms. Some of them are under 1,000 years old. Scientists consider the island a hot spot for volcanoes, pun intended. Nearly a third of the basaltic lava that reaches the Earth's surface in recorded history came from Icelandic eruptions. Fisher swarms, like the ones before the 2023 eruption, cover 30% of the Nordic country. For this reason, only a quarter of the island is inhabited. Norse Vikings were the first people to settle in Iceland at the beginning of the 10th century. Nature threw them a loud welcoming party. Just a few years after their arrival, they witnessed one of the greatest volcanic eruptions in history. Vikings came from a region without volcanoes, so they had no clue as to what was going on. Today, Icelanders are used to such events. This is good because their homeland is entering a new era of volcanic activity. Volcanologists suspect that recent events are an introduction to decades of more frequent eruptions. The peninsula that is home to Earth's youngest volcano is just 17 miles southwest of Iceland's capital city. It's been dormant for a long time. Present-day eruptions there are a reminder that the natural processes that created Iceland are still ongoing. Recently, scientists discovered that there's a historical link between volcanic eruptions in the north of Europe and glaciers. Our planet went through at least five major ice ages. These were exceptionally lengthy periods when the average temperature on Earth dropped. The result was the expansion of ice sheets across northern Europe and North America. The last ice age ended some 10,000 years ago. Researchers are still trying to fully understand how these glacial periods affected volcanic activity. They suspect that the sheer weight of all that ice disrupts the flow of magma underground. When glaciers retreat, the pressure is lifted. This makes it easier for lava to flow upward to the surface where it bursts.